Nehemiah comes, let's see if I remember the way I've memorized the books, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, Job, Psalms. So if you can crack the Bible into the middle, find Psalms and go backwards, you'll find it pretty quickly. That's how I, that's how my mind works. I don't know how yours does when it comes to these things. But, um, well, last week I had to tell you a um, cowboy boot story. Do you remember that? Nobody came up to me afterwards and said, John, that really blessed me. So I, <laughs> I'm joking. It was, a, um, it was fitting for our barbecue that we had to be able to fit in a, uh, a cowboy joke. And I, I couldn't help but think in relation to this book that actually I know a joke as it relates to Nehemiah because there is the question of who is the shortest person in the Bible. Have you ever heard that before because some people do think it was Nehemiah I know that's pretty bad and others though think it was Bildad the shoe height so that's pretty much of a groaner as well and then of course the final was Peter because he slept on his watch that was, I know, it was pretty, I had to do it. It was Nehemiah, but as we launch into a series of messages, they're, they're called prayers of the righteous, and Nehemiah is the first that I'll be speaking to you about. And I have to say that this entire series um, excited me in a way, because as I went through, there are a few prayers in the Bible which have been picked on and named after the person who prayed them. And this is one of them. Uh, when somebody will say a Nehemiah prayer, next week I'll have the opportunity, Lord willing, to talk about Jabez. And there's quite a lot about uh, the, the prayer of Jabez as it relates to uh, what that particularly means. But in this case, Nehemiah's prayer, I think think you'll be blessed by what you learn because all of us have prayed a Nehemiah prayer, whether we even knew we prayed it or not. So we're going to start by reading one of Nehemiah's prayers, and then there's the second of Nehemiah's prayers. There are two that I'm going to highlight for you and only speak to you uh, predominantly about about, uh, the second. So the first, let's begin reading in verse 4. Nehemiah chapter 1 and verse 4. When I heard these things, I sat down and wept. For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven, and then I said, Lord, the God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and keep his commandments, verse 6. Let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer your servant is praying before you day and night for your servants, the people of Israel. I confess the sins we Israelites, including myself and my father's family, have committed against you. We have acted very wickedly toward you. We have not obeyed the commands, decrees, and laws you gave your servant Moses. Verse 8, remember the instruction you gave your servant Moses, saying, if you're unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and obey my commands, then even if your exiled people are at the farthest horizon, I will gather them from there and bring them to the place I've chosen as a dwelling for my name. Verse 10, they are your servants. And your people, whom you redeemed by your great strength and your mighty hand. Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of this your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight in revering your name. Give your servant success today by granting him favor in the presence of this man. I was the cupbearer to the king. Let's just go to the Lord in prayer before we continue. Father, we're moved any time that we read of the prayers of one of your people. 
but especially as it relates to a prayer of a humble prophet. Lord, as we read these words, we recognize the strength that exists between the prayer of a righteous person and the ear of a holy God. Father, help us to recognize what's going on here. Be attentive to it and learn from it so that we too might participate in praying the way that they've prayed. Speak to us today, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm just going to rush through a few points that I pick out of this prayer because, as I said, it's not the one I want to talk about. But things I noticed from it, he keenly, Nehemiah keenly knew who God is. And uh, my grammar is correct because Nehemiah is past tense, but God is present tense. So he keenly knew, past tense, who God is, present tense. He had an understanding of who he was talking to. He recognized and was willing to both acknowledge his, his family's, and his people's sins and confess them before God. He recognized that they... There was an, uh, a sinfulness in existence where God could have every excuse not to listen. And he recognized that he, if he confessed, he, was, he would have the ear of God. The third thing is he knew of God's promises and his mercies. No doubt through the life of Nehemiah he'd witnessed the mercies of God. He'd seen and heard of the promises and watched some of those things being fulfilled. So he knew God was both willing and capable to answer his prayer as he prayed it. And then he asked for God's favor. He prayed for a prosperous audience with the king. But I love the words that he used, and maybe you picked up on it too. But he doesn't call the king the king. He says, this man This man, this mere man, recognizing the difference between who God was and who a king is. I mean, can you imagine saying the words, he's just a king? He's only just a king. It's not as if he's an important person like you, God. He's just a king. He's a mere man. And there was a recognition of that. This week, one of my friends posted this, and I thought it was interesting. The fastest thing on earth is prayer. Because it reaches God before you even speak the words. There was a knowledge in Nehemiah's heart in knowing that God would answer prayer. And he could answer prayer even before it was prayed. And he had a, a, a recognition of the power of prayer. So as I said, if you read those words, you see the heart of Nehemiah being poured out before God in this desire. He wept, he mourned over what needed to be done and recognized he within himself didn't have any power to do anything about it. It would take a movement from the king to see anything change. And so he came before God and he asked him for favor and he asked him for a good audience with the king. So that was his big prayer that he'd prayed beforehand. But as I said, that's not the one I want to talk to you about. Look at chapter 2 of Nehemiah. Chapter 2, and we're going to begin reading, and it is very short, in verse 4. He's standing before the king now, and the king said to me, What is it you want? Then I prayed to the God of heaven, verse 5, and I answered the king, if it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor in his sight, and then he goes on. Do you see the prayer? Did you read it the way I did in verse 4? He didn't even have words that came from his mouth before the king. There was no pause in his audience before the king where he said, when the king asked him that question, what is it you want? Hang on just a minute, king, your majesty, I need to pray. And he takes himself off and prays. No, it's not what happens here at all. 
What happens is that Nehemiah in an instant poured out his heart in inaudible words that would take up no time on the scale of timeline before the king. And then he spoke to the king. I just ask you this morning, have you ever been in a situation where you were confronted with something you needed desperately to have God's help on, but didn't have the opportunity to get on your phone and put on WhatsApp across the prayer line? Help! I need help. The king's asking me what to do. Please pray now. But there's no opportunity You can't turn and ask other Christians who you know to join with you and unite their hearts in prayer because you have that audience. Instead, you have only just a moment of time between when the question is asked and when you have to respond that you need help from the God of heaven. You need the opportunity to be able to have an inaudible prayer with God. So when I say that there is a coined phrase that says Nehemiah's prayer is something that people pray regularly and refer to, it's because there have been times in all of our lives when we're confronted with a situation, we have no time to pray, but we send up a Nehemiah prayer. What might that prayer be? Help. You know, what might that prayer be? The cry of my heart. Oh, God, what am I going to say next? But all of these things taking place inaudibly in your heart and before God, not like chapter 1, verses 4 through 11, where an audible, long prayer is said. This is an opportunity when nothing is said, but you need God just the same. So here are my four points I'd like to really highlight for you within that context this morning. The first is, Nehemiah enjoyed a regular, healthy prayer life. You can't come to an incident in a time in your life when you need God's help and you need the opportunity to pray quickly, but then really it's not something you do regularly. You don't usually talk to God, and therefore now it's as if you almost need a reintroduction of who you are before you could even ask God for something. The basis of prayer from chapter 2, verse 4 that Nehemiah had was based upon the fact that he had a healthy prayer life. He had already a time spent regularly with God where God knew what was on Nehemiah's heart. He knew where he stood with God because he had fellowship and communion on a regular basis with him. So when it came time to his panicked prayer, as I might call it, he didn't need to reintroduce himself to God because he already had a relationship with him. The second thing is he shared the heart of God. You know, there's nothing... There's no prayer that God would rather answer than one that is consistent with his own heart and his own will. When we pray for people to become Christians, and there are those of you who have for years prayed for those that you love to become a Christian, to see the light and to come to faith, and you've prayed and prayed and prayed, but you know when you pray that prayer that you aren't trying to convince God that this person is worthy of salvation. You know that God loves them as much, if not more, than you do. You know that actually it's within the heart of God, as the as the Bible already says, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. You already know that God has a heart to see people come to to faith, to have to come to salvation. And therefore, when you pray. You're not praying alone. You're actually joining your heart with the heart of God in prayer for that person. I have through the years had the opportunity to counsel or um, uh, 
have an, an audience with people who have been broken hearted over the lost loved ones that they've had and how they really want to see them come to Christ. And their broken heartedness feels very lonely. When a person is praying for the salvation of another, there is a lonely feeling because sometimes you see the frustration and feel you're the only one given the opportunity to be able to see that person come to faith. And if if you can't do it, who will kind of thing? Actually, you're not alone. God loves them more than you do. I'll never forget when I had the opportunity to sit in front of an elderly lady who'd been praying for her relatives for years to come to Christ. And with an emotion that couldn't even express itself, she said, John, what can I do? They won't listen to me. And I'm the only one who cares. And I had the opportunity at that point to say, no, you're not. You're not the only one that cares because God wants them to get become a Christian and, and be saved more than you do. He has more of a heart for them than even you do. And even though you have an opportunity and responsibility to share the gospel with them, God ultimately, you're only speaking the message that God has a heart for that's even greater than yours. He shared the heart of God, Nehemiah did. He was grieved and understood what needed to be done, just like God did. God had placed upon the heart of Nehemiah, broken his heart. You know, we use the buzzword as Christians oftentimes, I was burdened. I love the old old English, meaning the the church in England in, in centuries past have used the word, I was exercised. In my spirit, you know, I, I was exercised. I had a, had a burden. I felt, I felt a passion about it that I felt I was sharing with God to see something done. And I love that God will excite us. He will exercise us. He will burden us with something which is heavily upon his own heart. And Nehemiah shared that so much so that he broke down when he prayed the first time. He broke down with emotion, saying, God, please give me an audience with the king to get something done because what I've seen is devastating before his people. And God shared that heart. The third thing is he was afraid to go before the king. You know, I think we have this image, and if you were to Google Nehemiah uh, in your, uh, you know, pastime this afternoon you would you would find pictures of a very bold old looking man you know because because all prophets are not wimpy characters they're they're never artistically portrayed as being a wimp they're they're artistically portrayed as being men of great strength and courage and faith and power and 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 distinction and all of these are very powerful images And yet in reality, they were men just like you and I. And they had fears just like you and I. And when it comes to going before the king, going before an authority, going before somebody who could easily wave his scepter and have your head removed, there was a bit of fear that came out of the heart of Nehemiah. He had a fear that was in him. But he also, the second part of that is he had a determination. You know, I hope, I hope and pray that if you haven't yet over the course of your Christian life, I hope you have the opportunity to do something scary for God. And when I say that, I don't mean just pick something and do it. I mean, that'd be, you know, I think I'm going to go do this and it looks terrifying, but I'm going to do it. I don't mean that. I mean, when something is heavily laid upon your heart and you know God wants you to do it and it's terrifying, it's scary, but you also know you just have to do it. 
There have been a couple of times in my life, and I express this from experience, and this is why I want you to have it as well, because I have had times in my life when I knew that God wanted me to do something that could actually be life-threatening. I was actually going to do something that I might not live through. And there was a fear inside of me that I thought, oh, goodness me, you know, this is, this is really big. Except there was such a passion behind me that I said, but I don't care. I still have to do it. I know God wants me to do it. Because a lot of the things that God asks you to do across the course of your Christian life have consequences. Let me, let me just express this. I've known people, I've known um, when I was up in Stoke-on-Trent, there were a few men who were Ir- Iranian. I always say it wrong, Iranian, Iranian. I don't know how, but he, they were from Iran, and they had come to Christ as their savior. And by doing that, they knew that the consequence for doing that would mean complete separation from their entire family. They would never again be able to talk to their mom, their dad, their sisters, their brothers, their cousins, their aunts. Or all. They were severing all ties with everyone in their family, whom, by the way, they loved. But coming to Christ for them was consequential. It was heavy. But they chose to do it because they knew they had to. They knew They had no other choice. It was the right thing to do. Nehemiah was afraid to go before the king, but he was unwavering in his determination. The reason I want you to experience it isn't because I like to watch you sweat. That was awful about feet sweating, by the way. How how many? A pint. Half a pint. Okay, good. That's better than a pint. But still bit stinky Um, but you know it's not because I want to watch you sweat that I say I'd love to see you do something dangerous it's because I want you to see how God comes behind and supports and takes you through those times because there's nothing like seeing the power of God at work through your life There is nothing quite like the the experience of knowing that you're going in the strength of God. I think David, when you look across the life of David, and you've read many accounts in the scripture of all that David did, he, he tasted of it as a boy. When he was just a young lad facing Goliath. When he was, we want to say, when he was so stupid, he didn't even know what he was doing. I mean, there would be part of us who'd wonder if David even had any concept. Do you know what you're doing? But he had the boldness of God. He knew there was a cause. He knew whose side he was on, and he knew who was behind him. And he didn't care what happened. And he slew Goliath and chased away the entire army of the Philistines. Then you say, well, is that powerful? I don't know. I think if I were a lad, I'd be pretty, pretty chuffed, you know, especially when the cowardice armies of, of Israel were behind him all cowing down. And here I went forward. And throughout David's life, he took that experience and knew that God would see him through. Because once you've experienced that type of of power that God gives to those who do his will, then there's there's a sense inside of you that says, you know what? I'm going to go on and take forward his name, and no matter what happens, I'm going to stand with him. So the last thing I want to say about that little prayer is this. He panicked, he prayed, and he spoke. And I know you say, John, there's nothing in there that says that Nehemiah panicked. You know, I believe he did. Standing before the king when he heard the words that the king spoke. And I say that. Why else would he pray again? He'd already prayed in chapter one, that great big long thing. He could have said, oh, prayer's already done. I don't need any more. I've already said it. It's paragraphs long. And God is with me. And hey, what's the difference? But he got to that point and the king says, what is it you want? 
And it says he prayed. I believe he panicked first. He prayed. But then he spoke. He spoke. He opened his mouth and he communicated what God wanted him to say. And come what may, he knew he was doing what God wanted him to do. So I introduce you, if you're not already aware, I introduce you today to a Nehemiah prayer. Because the chances are great across the course of your life, you're going to be confronted with an incident where you won't have time. And all you can do is send up an inverbal, inaudible, quick prayer to ask God to help. And my hope is you'll have enough of a relationship going into it that he'll know who you are. He'll know what you want. He'll have answered you before you even ask. And he'll be there with you during that time. Because Nehemiah prayers can be very powerful prayers. Amen. Let's pray.